Hello students of grade 10, my name is Nisha Bamfield and I will be your office administration teacher for today. Picking up from our previous lesson, we will be looking at indexing. Our objectives are to define or to outline what is indexing and the procedures of cross-referencing. Our second objective is to list the procedures for dealing with inactive files. Let us go right into our lesson. Management specific objective content are as follows. At the end of this lesson, students will be able to do the following. Define and explain the concept of indexing. Describe methods and procedures for cross-referencing. Outline the procedures for dealing with inactive files. Understand the use of equipment and or supplies in records and information management, and to identify legal stipulations governing access to the retention of documents. Meaning and procedures of indexing. Concept and meaning of indexing. Index is a guide. It is a list of names, subjects, and dates. It is used for locating documents. Index indicates exact location of records. Indexing refers to the system of preparing index of documents. The documents can be in files, drawers, and filing cabinet. Index in an office is prepared to know the location of files and documents. It is a reference list about names, subjects, and dates. Indexing is essential for smooth operation of filing systems. The purpose of indexing. Indexing is the heart of filing. Its purposes are as follows. Number one, it facilitates filing. The main purpose of indexing is to facilitate the filing process. An office receives several documents daily. Indexing provides a reference list of files by names, subjects, and date. The needed files can be quickly identified for proper filing of documents. Indexing ensures speed in filing. Number two, it facilitates location. Indexing facilitates easy and quick location of files and documents, and when needed, it is easily retrieved. This helps decision-making, planning, and control in the office. Number three, it facilitates cross-referencing. A single document can be related to various subjects. Indexing facilitates its cross-references. This improves office decisions. Number four, it increases efficiency. Indexing helps to increase office efficiency. It serves and saves time and efforts in searching documents. It brings smoothness and promptness in office operations. Working efficiently in office spaces an employee increases his or her chances to be efficient. Office cost decreases due to increase in efficiency. Number five, it maintains secrecy. It is another purpose of indexing to maintain privacy. Indexing helps to maintain secrecy about office matters. Office files and documents cannot be located easily without the help of an index. Number six, it creates systematic filing. Indexing helps to develop a systematic filing system. Filing without indexing is incomplete. 
Filing systems in modern offices cannot be operated without indexing. Let us turn our attention to the types of indexing. The nature, size, and volume of records determine the type of indexing for an office. There are various types of indexing, like book, card, visible card, loose leaf indexing, etc. Different types of indexing systems are used by different offices. The different types of indexing can be described as follows. Number one, book indexing. The most common type of indexing uses register book for indexing. It has alphabets A to Z on the right side. Each alphabet is given some pages and are visible briefly. The names and subjects of files are written on the left side of the page in alphabetical order. A telephone directory is an example of book indexing. Number two, loose leaf indexing or book indexing in loose form. It uses loose sheets of paper for indexing. The papers have alphabets on the right side from A to Z and are visible briefly. The names and subjects of files are written on the left-hand side in alphabetical order. The loose sheets are fastened by a metal ring or hangers. Number three, card indexing. It uses thick cards of standard size. The cards are placed in drawers or cabinets in a vertical position. An iron rod keeps the cards together. One card is allotted to one name or subject. Cards are arranged in alphabetical, geographical, or chronological order. Guide cards are used to divide in sections. This type of indexing is found in libraries. Number four, visible card indexing. The visible card indexing uses cards in a standardized size. The cards are flatly placed in a tray. Each card overlaps the other card while they are easily visible. The tray is filled or fitted in a drawer and can be easily pulled out for reference. Banks uses this type of indexing for specimen signatures. Number five, strip card indexing. It is an improvement of a visible card indexing. Strips made of thick paper are fitted in a metal frame. The strip contains one line information. All the strips are easily visible. One strip card is used for one name or subject. It is alphabetically or numerically arranged. It is generally used in clubs and social organizations. It is used for information about name, addresses, telephone number, etc. Number six, rotary card indexing. Rotary card indexing is an improved form of visible card indexing. It uses paper cards of a standard size. The cards are fitted in a wrong metal rod with slits. The metal rod is fitted in a rotary machine. The cards are arranged in slits in alphabetical order. The rotary machine is rotated clockwise to locate the needed card. Now let's turn our attention to the qualities of good indexing. Good indexing should be fit with a filing system and process qualities like simplicity, flexibility, economy, safety, suitability, etc. Essential qualities of good indexing can be described as follows. Simplicity. 
Simplicity is the most important quality of indexing. A good indexing system should be simple. It should be easy to understand and operate. Employees should easily gain knowledge about it. Economical. A good indexing should be economical. It should not be expensive to install or operate. The cost of materials and equipment should not be high. The indexing system should be compact. It should not occupy too much office space. Flexibility. A good indexing should be flexible. It should have the capacity to change with changing needs for filing. It should be able to discard dead references and add new references. Quick location. A good indexing system should be quickly located for access to needed files and documents. It should ensure efficient and smooth office operations. Suitability. A good indexing system should be suitable to the needs of a filing system. It should facilitate speed in filing documents. Safety. Safety is another essential quality of indexing and the indexing system. A good indexing system should be safe. It should be protected from insects, rats, dust, water, fire, etc. It should not be accessible to unauthorized persons. It should ensure secrecy about internal matters of the office. 7. Cross referencing. A good index system should provide cross reference for documents that are related to more than one file. Let us now look more specifically into what is cross referencing. It is an instance within a document which refers to related information elsewhere in the same document. I'll repeat, it is an instance within a document which refers to related information elsewhere in the same document. When cross-referencing, what should we do? When a subject matter is broad and contains several different filing features or is closely related to two or more subjects, when the document affects or is functionally connected to two or more departments, we should cross-reference. When a document is moved from one location to another, cross-reference. Methods and procedures of cross-referencing. A. When cross-referencing records for filing, check to see that the material is complete. Analyze the item for inclusion in the appropriate primary classification. Analyze the item for inclusion in the appropriate record series. Analyze the item for inclusion in the appropriate folder. File the item in the front of the folder. If a folder does not exist, create a label for a new folder. And finally, integrate the folder into the already existing filing system. B. Returning records to the file. Check to see that the material is complete or contains the very information that was there prior to being given out. Enter the date of return on the out card. Remove the out card and replace it with the folder. C. Charge out rules out cards. Use checkout folders, never individual documents. Out cards are used to monitor the removal of folders from the file. Information on the out card should include 1. File folder title. 2 borrower's name, three, date charged out, four, date returned. For convenience, keep several out cards in the front 
of each file drawer or on top of each file cabinet. Old cards can be personalized for individual users. Need only contain file folders, titles, date charged, out, and date returned. At this stage of our lessons, we will be looking at the procedures for dealing with inactive files. Number one, verify file retention timeframes. The first step in managing your inactive files is to identify what documents to keep and what to destroy. From a legal standpoint, review your record retention schedule to make sure it's up to date with state and federal regulations. If you're unsure, consult with your accountant and lawyer. Number two, classify, label, and index. Characterize your files into classes and series based on their functional need and clearly label with their retention periods. This helps you separate inactive files from those that are needed daily. Decide what needs to be sent to an offsite and determine what needs to be destroyed. Purge. Use a professional shredding and destruction service to purge expired inactive files. A screened shredding specialist collects your expired records and based on your preference, either shreds your documents on site while you watch or transport them to a shredding plant for secure destruction. You should receive a certificate of destruction when your documents are destroyed. Four, organize by active and inactive. It may be the simplest thing to store records by date of intervention or by alphabetical order, but this could mean sifting through very old records. It is advisable to use divisions, but separate them into a traffic light system of red, amber, and green. Just a suggestion. Green meaning the most active, amber as semi-active, and red as inactive files, nearing the end of their lives or expiry date. Number five use a third-party manager. The most obvious is that you can seek to outsource your record storage facility or company. Using a third party can be expensive, but it is one way of creating physical space in the office and keeping files secure from possible damages or misfortunes. Six, keep inactive records off site. While you are organizing outsourcing your historical records, you might wish to separate out those that are nearing the end of their lifespan or their expiry date. Anything with a year or less could go in off-site storage. Let us turn our attention to the use of equipment and supplies in records and information management. We all know when it comes to filing, there are records that need to be properly filed, either in systematic or alphabetical orders. The equipment and or supplies that accommodate those files are of great importance. Some equipment used for filing are filing cabinet or drawers. Some supplies are folders, tags, index cards. The selection of storage equipment and supplies. The appropriate selection of storage equipment and supplies requires consideration of the following factors. One, type and value of records to be stored, to be retrieved. Degree of required protection of records. Efficiency 
and ease of use of equipment and systems. Space considerations. And this last one is most important, space considerations. Every office desires maximum space. So when selecting equipment and supplies for filing, always remember what space is needed. We will now look at the document retention policy. What is the document retention policy? A DRP or document retention policy will identify documents that need to be maintained, contain guidelines for how long certain documents should be kept, and save your company valuable computer and physical storage space. What is a document retention policy and why is it important? As was mentioned just now, the document retention policy helps you to maintain or contain guidelines for how long certain documents should be kept. Why is this important? A good record retention policy can also reduce legal risk and discovery costs, as well as recovery effort time associated with legitimate lawsuits. Destroying documents in accordance with a reasonable record retention policy can help protect your organization from legal risk. I'll repeat, destroying documents in accordance with a reasonable record retention policy can help protect your organization from legal risk. In other words, if your document retention policy says 10 years, and you destroy those documents before the 10 year span, then the organization will be liable to legal risk. How long are businesses and organizations required to maintain records? Let us consider the record cycle. We have distribution, active storage, inactive storage and retention, disposition, archiving, and creation. Having a clearly defined document retention policy, a DRP, can yield three primary benefits for businesses and organizations. Efficiency, safety, and peace of mind. First, because a DRP establishes and describes how physical and electronic records are managed, Locating key documents when they are needed is easier and more efficient. In the event of an investigation or lawsuit, having a well-drafted DRP may also demonstrate that there was a legitimate and neutral purpose for destroying the documents. Remember I said earlier, if the DRP says 10 years and you destroy documents before the 10 year span, the organization can be liable to legal suits. However, if the documents are of great concern or pose any threat to the organization or its partners, the company can draft a DRP that amends the prior DRP to, for destroying the new documents or the set of documents prior to the 10 year lifespan. So in that way, the company has provided legitimate and a neutral purpose for destroying the documents. Finally, a well executed DRP ensures that your organization abides by state and federal compliance standards with regards to document retention and document destruction. Here are some legal stipulations that govern the access to the retention of documents. There are numerous laws and regulations regarding document retention, including tax audit procedures by the Internal Revenue Services, or the IRS, employment laws such as the Fair Labor Standards Act, FSLA, the Health Insurance Portability and Accountability Act, 
H-I-P-A-A, the Employee Retirement and Income Security Act, E-R-I-S-A, and mandates by the Occupational Safety and Health Administration, O-S-H-A. In addition to these federal laws, there may be numerous state and local document retention provisions that apply specifically to your business or organization and or country. Some legal stipulations that govern the access of retention of documents. Let's look at the following. Storage and security. Records are kept securely with clear procedures in place for gaining access to them and for any sharing of information between those providing the care and between the care provider and other agencies. If the care service close, it would still need to arrange for any records to be kept securely for a minimum legally required retention period. Example, three years in the case of care records. Access to records. Records should be available to the service user or his or her legal representative involved in his or her care and treatment. Example, where someone lacks the mental capacity to take or make decisions on his or her own or her care treatment and staff. Therefore, all should know where the records are kept and how to gain access to them and be able to contribute to them where necessary. Any request to see a person's record must be addressed with reference to the requirements of the Drafted Data Protection Act of 1998. Here students, we have come to the end of today's lesson. I wanna thank you for paying keen attention and for being involved in our lesson on indexing. My name is Nija Bamfield, and I was happy to be your educator for today. At the end of this lesson, you will find three questions that you are to complete in your notebooks. They are as reads. Number one, what legal procedures govern the retention of files in Guyana? Number two, in your own words, why should cross-reference be done? How often do you think this should be performed? And number three, identify 10 students in your class and create an index card for each of them. Explain in 120 words how you will go about filing each card.
Thank you once again for having me. And this ends our lesson on indexing. Thank you.